But now for King and Country, a special programme for Remembrance Sunday, in which three local men relive their experiences of the First World War. The programme is introduced by Judy Merry. Oh, we don't want to lose you, but we think you ought to go for your king and your country. Both need you so. We shall want you and miss you, but with all our might and main, we shall cheer you. When my brother was killed, my, my mother got very ill and she never got over him getting killed because he was the only boy, you see. And there was a bomb at the officer's nest. He's buried in France. No, it was a sad day. And I never knew anything about it until I came home. I'd been away for a holiday. And the lady met me in the street and she says, tell your mother I'm very sorry to you about her loss. Well, I, I, I says, what's the loss? She says, do I do you not know? I says, no. She, she says, George just got killed. A Blackburn lady recalling the death of her brother. He was just one of the million British and Empire troops who never came back from the First World War, a war which began 62 years ago. But some men did come back and are still alive today. Three of those men, George Seal, Ernest Wodaker and Alfred Hill, still have vivid memories of the Great War. George Seal fought on the Western Front at the Battle of Luz. Then, as now, he lived in Rottenstall and he remembers joining the Winchester Rifle Brigade as a corporal in 1914. But he was under a bit of parental pressure. My mother was, kept being on to me at the end of 1914 when I was going to join the army. So anyhow, in January I got uh, fed up, I said I'll join it now. So uh, I, I told the boss where I worked, I went to the recruiting office and joined up then. As a matter of interest, why did you join a regiment in the south? Why did you join the rifles rather than the Lancashire regiment? Well, the reason I joined the uh, uh, southern regiment was I knew they were being Lancashire bred and born, I, was, I wasn't being patriotic really, but I thought if I got in a Lancashire regiment or a Yorkshire regiment, I should start being homesick and I should be doing it, uh, doing a break. And I thought, well, if I get right down the south and I shan't be wealthy off, I shan't be able to do a break at all. So that was the reason I, I joined the, uh, the Rifle Brigade. So, so once you went from Southampton across to France, what were your first impressions of France? Did it look like a country at war or not? Uh, not, not, to, not where we were. We were not when we landed at Lyon. We, we, we landed at Lyon, and then we got on, a, got in, got on a train. First time we'd been in a train. We were on, riding in a horse boxes, packed as a vacation for for two days, and then we started. We started out marching, going up to the line, we had a three days march to Levante and we kept uh, going up into the front line for, for odd days, going up at the night time and then coming back the following night to, to break us in, you see. Our uh, officer, he was uh, always like just to show off and he used to call us up in the middle of the night, alarm, that the alarm had gone and we wanted to open the front line. This went on for four or five nights, and my officer said to me, he says, uh, Corporal, he says, there's something, something fishy going on with your platoon. I don't know what it is. I says, I'll tell you. I says, they got fed up with doing the, going out every night in full pack just for a rendezvous around to let people see us in the dark. I says, and they're going up without kit. What next time they call up, he says, I says, I can't stop them. I says, and the sergeant can't stop them. I said, then he's going as well. Well, he said, probably I'd love to do the same. So anyhow, the alarm went again. We'd left all our kit at all in the farmhouse, in the farm, in the barn where we used to sleep, and uh, went sailing away with uh, nothing only straw in our valises. Well, I we thought it's another night, another night off. And then 
gradually we could hear guns in the distance and we thought, oh hell, we're for it now. Anyhow, we kept going on and going on and then we came into the communication trenches. Well, we struggled through them and they were over a foot deep in water. It was a terrible wet night. And very few duck boards knocking about. We got in the front line. We took over from the KRRs. The officer says, he says, well, he says, I'll have to report it now. So what's happened? So the colonel said, well, he says, uh, they'll have to go back for it at dawn. And they won't have to use the communication trenches. They'll have to go over the top. We were only 50, 60 yards from the enemy. So we went and got our kit back. Well, we were in there, we were in the front line then for five, five or six weeks without, without a break. And uh, when we came out, we were, you can tell we weren't clean, we were filthy. We thought, oh, we're, we're laughing, nothing will happen now. Anyhow, when we got back to Levante, before we could have a bath of that, he had an orderly room for 13 platoon. And uh, he told us straight what he thought about us. And we whispered what we thought about him. So he says, anyhow, he says, uh, the quartermaster and me, we've decided that we'll charge you all with a full kit. And we were stopped a full kit. Of course, we knew where the money were going. It sounds as if your platoon was, uh, had was, something of a reputation. It had a good reputation at the at 13 platoon, I'll tell you. What were the conditions like in the trenches, food and, and living conditions? Uh, they weren't good at all. They weren't, they weren't good. If you got to make a dug out quickly, you hadn't time to do it. You got to, it was just, you didn't know whether it would fall on top of you or not because there was no preparations in those days. Everything were, were uh, done on the speed. We slipped more on the fire steps than in the dug out because they hadn't time to make them, you see. It was rough. Anyhow, we go back after the five weeks, that's about the end of March, and uh, we start preparing then for uh, another round of trench warfare. They had me out as a sniper in no man's land up a tree. We were like that then, in and out, in and out of the trenches, all along the line, but always walking, no riding, always walking, till uh, September, then we came back to Levante, that was our base, and we heard rumours about this Battle of Louis coming on. Well, it started. The officer kept saying, come on lads, we'll go over again. Well, we, we were that exhausted, we couldn't, we had to pack in at the finish, we couldn't, we were exhausted. And uh, the uh, KRRs have practically got wiped out with trying to get up to us. And, uh, and then we started clearing up after the battle, and after that it finished and uh, a few days after we were out in no man's land and we heard them shelling us with shrapnel again as a working party because I, I turned and folks said I was running away I, and laid flat down which they were instructed to do if you got if you're shelling and I, I, I got it in the I got it in the behind right through my legs and uh, I lay there for several hours and Stretcher bearers couldn't come up, they didn't come up, but they wouldn't come up, we don't know which. Anyhow, I got away at the finish. But what were your feelings when you were lying there for four and five Not hours good. of the stretch? Did, did you really think that you'd had it then? I think I'll look that. Well, when you these, these 18 and 20 pounders bursting overhead and you don't know where the shrapnel's going to hit, you know, and it was, uh, well, I gave it my grandson, the bullets that came out of my leg, they were like little iron marbles that, that came out of them. I, I gave them him, he wanted them. So anyhow, they fetched me out at the finish and uh, took me to the field dressing station, but they didn't bother, they just wrapped it up, my leg, and took me to the hospital and uh, a Frenchman, the French doctor came, jabbering away, uh, and of course I couldn't understand what he said. So uh, there was an orderly there, I said, do you understand English? He says, yes. I said, well, what the hell is he talking about? Oh, he says, they're going to cut your leg off. I says, they're hell like. He says, they are. I says, they're not. I says, I haven't given him permission. So I says, I, so I, I picked up a cup and flung it. I saw him down the wall and I flung it at him. So he comes up back to me and he puts a red label on my, on my dress. And he gave me a form. He, 
I says, what's this? He says, he wants you to sign it. You, you'll have your leg off. I says, I'm not signing it. Well, he says, if you don't sign it, they'll bung you back to England as a dangerous person. I says, all right, send me back. And with that, I, uh, I was sent back. We landed at Southampton. And uh, the ambulance, the hospital train was going to Shrewsbury. We were the first, first lot in Bellevue Hospital at Shrewsbury in the First World War to go in there. Coming up in the ambulance train, it was a rather amusing thing. A fella, a fella about 30, running, running along the, the uh, corridor of the ambulance. And he was a, he was a time serving artilleryman. And uh, every time he saw an officer come in, he'd limp like mud and cry out with pain. So uh, I, I didn't think anything about it at the time. Anyhow, he landed at the same hospital as us. And uh, I says, what's the matter with you? He says, nothing. I says, uh, what do you mean, nothing? He says, I'm all right. He says, nothing. What do you mean? He says, you've been out in murder. He says, I know that. He says, I've been out from the beginning and I'm not going back no more. He says, I managed to swing the lead, and, and he swung the lead, and he, he swung it all the time, up to me, up to me, leaving the, the convalescent home. What about your attitude after you'd come back wounded, and you'd seen what was going on over there? Did you feel that the people at home didn't understand? They didn't understand. They didn't understand anything. They didn't know what it was. But they learned. They learned the lesson before it was over. They did. They learned the lesson before it was over. No, they didn't. They didn't seem to bother. At Did all. you try to explain what it'd been like? Yes, but they, they, they wouldn't listen. They just laughed. They, they thought it was something, just an entertainment. Till they started losing their own relatives, and then it uh, it dawned on them then that there's a war on. How many of your close friends did you lose? All of them. All of them. Shot and blown to blazes, and never. Well, a lot of them were never found. You know, they were just they were just scattered. But what was your attitude towards the, the Germans? Did you ever meet any face to face, or were they always just the the people? Oh, yes, you met them. Oh, it was a it wasn't a good attitude. I'll tell you. No, it was. A, it, they were they weren't liked at all. Of course, they've altered now. They've altered. But my attitude was kill or be killed. George Seal with some memories of France. But while Mr. Seal was fighting on the western...